thank you. This evening we find ourselves in the midst of a conversation of most practical concern, namely realizing that in the life of the parish, through prayer and the sacraments, we come to participate in the eternal life of God. This is the underlying aspect which I think Father Westhaver has been directing us to consider, that principle or sacramental system or ethos which brings us human creatures from the lowest points of our existence to the heights of heavenly participation. Firstly, I want to thank the committee for inviting me to offer a response. Being new to this, I am truly honored. Moreover, I would like to thank Father Westhaver, I don't know where he is, over there, hiding over, thank you, for sending me resources and providing me with information well in advance so I could be prepared. I know sometimes that doesn't always happen. I'm delighted to be here and hopefully I'll be able to offer something in this reflection which is edifying for the life of the church. In his paper, Father Westhaver has cited Edward Monroe who expresses the idea that the parish is a microcosm of the diocese as the diocese is of the church. The parish is the central place where the church's teachings are put into practice. And according to the theology of those involved in the Oxford movement, such as Edward Pusey, this is mainly associated with the sacraments. How through the sacramental system, the highest and lowest are brought together in a mystical way, so that the human creature is brought into union with God. This recapitulation means the second Adam Christ is the repetition in divine truth of the first Adam, who turned away from God. The second Adam repeats the whole natural development of man at a higher level of divine reality, thereby making us partakers of his divine nature in the sacraments. There are three aspects which struck me that I, that I think are important for my reflection here tonight on this theme that, of Father Westhaver's topic and will help contribute to the conversation. The first is the political dynamic in the Church of England at the time when the Oxford movement had first taken root. John Keeble's sermon declaring national apostasy in England sounded the alarms and induced a new movement in the church as early as 1833. The Church of England was becoming lax and nominal. Too many of the modern notions and philosophies were overtaking the true doctrine of the church which was meant to be upheld by the traditionally Christian nation of England. The latitudinarians had perhaps become too pluralistic so that the truth of the Catholic faith and the fact of England's Christian roots was beginning to be forgotten. Sound doctrine was being ignored in the midst of revolutionary ideas and the sacramental system of the ancient church was being undermined often purely by political and ideological interests. A second aspect has to do with England's academic exchange with continental thought. This is especially obvious in Edward Pusey's scholarly visits to Germany, in which he engaged even with people such as Friedrich Schleiermacher, who would later come to greatly influence modern Protestant theology, especially through Karl Barth. In Germany, Pusey was inculcated into the rigor of academic linguistic studies. While on the continent, he not only had time to focus on learning the essential languages for a deeper theological engagement, but he also observed some of the general problems with Protestant thought, which had arisen since the Reformation. He observed the difficulties with Lutheran scholasticism, pietism, a trend to rationality and rationalism, and the general drift of modern Protestant thought which was moving the church away from a truly Catholic and practical understanding of the fi Christian faith. As he noticed this in Germany, it was clear to Pusey that a certain theological decadence had already set its roots in the Church of England as well. In essence, he observed that the new theology of the modern period had lost touch with the roots of the holy Catholic and apostolic faith and especially with respect to the practicality of the sacramental system which brings us Christians into union with God. 
Thirdly, I want to note in my reflection how much the Oxford movement has built bridges and tied the Church of England back to the ancient faith which existed before the Reformation. Figures involved in the Oxford movement have helped to restore a relationship between Eastern Christianity and that of the West. Drawing deeply from Alexandrian sources, many figures in the Oxford movement have helped to replenish a common theological relationship with which naturally should have always existed between the East and the West. For figures such as Pusey, we see a general rejection of the rationalism inherent in Western Roman Catholic theology, such as the notion of transubstantiation. Moreover, there is even a hesitancy to engage in conversation in the Protestant camp surrounding notions of the real presence or the later Lutheran formula of consubstantiation of our Lord, of the consubstantiation of our Lord in the, the Eucharist. The true meaning of the sacramental system lies rather in communion with God. It is a sacred mystery. It has to do with deification or what the Eastern Church calls theosis. It is about God coming down to us in the incarnation and by his grace and mercy, restoring us to his image and likeness which he made us in, lifting us out of the mire of sin and despair in which we, lifting us out of the mire of sin and despair in which we live to raise us up to Christ, to his heavenly kingdom. You see said, the adoration of the contemplative before the mystery of the God who coming down to the lowest part of our need takes us to himself and exalts us in Christ to the heavenly places. That is the temper and disposition which we ought to share. Christ took our nature into himself so that in him it is in Godded, deitate. The Greek theology of theosis is thus powerfully emphasized. And tonight we must remember that this all happens in the context of the sacramental life of the parish. But what made the most impact on me personally in reflecting on the subject of tonight's paper is the fact that Edward Pusey lost his wife quite early in their relationship. Thereafter, he chose to live a celibate life. In his penitential grief, he even had difficulty smiling, except to little children. He was an austere man who would take up the ascetical calling, but all the while, in his sorrow and grief, he beheld the glorious vision, the sacramental ethos, uplifted him, which ultimately turned his own earthly suffering into the joy of the heavenly kingdom. Thank you.